All right, so this is layered API security, what hackers don't want you to know, and uh, the cloud computing meetup. So thank you all for joining. Just once again, for any new participants, I'm going to be recording the conversation, and I'll have the recording to post uh, when it's all done. All right, so we are here to talk about API security today, but first, before that, we're gonna talk about the API lifecycle and API management, because a really good API lifecycle will lead you to creating a robust and scalable API. And API management is actually what leads you to securing your API. So we have talked about those a little bit before actually getting into securing your API. And of course, securing your API will lead to a great security posture. That's really what we're here to talk about today. And we're gonna talk about the API landscape just a little bit, so what's happening with APIs today in terms of protection and hacks. And we'll talk about layered security. And layered security is really where we'll get into how can you build upon layers of security on your API to maximize your API security. Real quick, uh, just about me and about Big Compass. Um, so uh, I am Aaron Lieberman. I'm an architect and cloud practice manager at Big Compass. And I come from an integration background and have experience and certified with technologies like MuleSoft and AWS and Azure. And the technologies that really allow you to create these, these great APIs quickly and integrate behind these APIs to connect your system. And Big Compass is a boutique IT consulting firm. And we specialize in integrations and technologies related to integrations. And that allows us to take an unbiased approach with our clients to solve our difficult clients' IT challenges. And that, that's using the right technology for the job and the right solution for the job. Because ultimately, we don't focus on one technology, we focus on building connections. And those connections between systems and applications and integrations, and most importantly, between people and organizations. Because probably the most value that, that we can provide is creating a community and, and network of meaningful connections and problem solvers. So we are partners with technology vendors like Azure and AWS and MuleSoft and Ping Identity, which we're going to see in this presentation, uh, which makes sense because we focus on those integrations and the APIs. And we need the ability, especially with, with Ping and these other API gateways, to properly secure those APIs, as we're seeing more and more APIs created with, with our clients. So feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, feel free to reach out to anyone at, at Big Compass uh, as well. Um, info at bigcompass.com would be a great email address. Or um, uh, we also have LinkedIn, you know, YouTube channels, so on and so forth. And my email address is Aaron at bigcompass.com if you ever want to chat more. So I am attacking an API right now. And I want to let that set in for a second. I'm attacking an API right now. But what am I doing? I'm, I'm talking with all of you. I'm completely hands-free, you know, here's my hands. And what I've done is I've just set a script and forgotten about it. And that's allowed me to attack an API that I've built completely asynchronously and here talking with all of you. That's exactly what hackers are doing today. Hackers are using machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to set scripts and forget about them. And once they get a hit, report back if, if their scripts find anything. But luckily, I'm not too worried about this attack because I have layers of API security on my API to be able to detect and block this attack that we'll see at the end. So let's talk about the API lifecycle and management. So in the API lifecycle, there's typically five phases. And your first phase is going to be your design phase. Really, really important phase. In your design phase is where you can build out your API spec. You know, maybe you're building RAML. If you're using MuleSoft, maybe using open API spec like Swagger, if you're using a different technology. But it's so important to be able to create this design and, and spec out your API and gather your requirements up front because I, I see so often that you know we create APIs and then we have to go in in the future and reverse engineer them, which just builds tech debt and, and headache for your development teams. So this design phase and gathering all of those requirements and thinking about your HTTP verbs and, and the resources you actually want to create in your API is so crucial. So I would absolutely recommend this. As well as in the design phase, you can start thinking about how are you going to manage and secure your API. So 
look at this, your, your design phase is your first phase and your management phase is your last phase. But in your first design phase, you're going to start thinking about that management piece and that will lead you to a successful implementation, you know, five, 10, 15 years in the future and creating a robust and secure API. So once you're done designing, your build phase is when you would give life to your API endpoints. You know, if you're building your, your API in Azure, you know, for example, which is what we're going to see today, this is where you can use Azure API Manager to proxy requests or, you know, Azure Functions or AWS Lambdas, for example, to give life to those API endpoints. Then you would go through a, a testing phase. We're not really going to belabor that point. I think we all know here what a good testing phase looks like. And once you're done with your QA phase, you can move on to deployment. And after deployment is done, is finally when you can start to get to managing and securing your API. And I would argue that this management phase is, is the most important phase because number one, it's an indefinite phase. And number two, this is where you actually get to securing your API. And you really need to think about, number one, how are you going to manage this indefinite phase of your API lifecycle? And how are you going to support that API? And number two, how are you going to keep that API up to date? You know, so maybe algorithms are updating or, or security measures are updating and you want to be able to stay current in your API security as well as your management. So really crucial phase there. So we're going to dive into the API management even a little bit more because within API management, there's sort of some sub phases. And within API management, typically what you can do with technologies, you know, like AWS, MuleSoft, and Azure is you would create your API. And what I mean by this is not actually building your API, but hooking your API into the security policy that you can start to protect your API with. So you're going to connect that API to security policies, which would allow you to start to secure your API at your API gateway level. And then you can manage and monitor. So, you know, technologies like Azure, for example, have great monitoring on your APIs. You can see policy violations. You can see how many requests were coming in at any one time, how many security policy um, violations there were, as well as latency on your API, which is always a great metric to be able to, to um, understand. So this leads you to that first line of defense, which is your API gateway security. And your API gateway security for the purposes of this conversation is going to be the first line of defense. And API gateway security is really good with protecting from rate limiting and throttling and ensuring that people with access to your API can make requests to your API, but people without access to your API cannot make requests to your API. And so it's important to note here that everything I have listed on the screen is probably what you folks are, are familiar with who are participating in this meetup. You know, it's the basic authentications of the world, it's IP whitelisting, it's client ID enforcement, OAuth 2.0, and, and so on and so forth. Really great for protecting your API and not leaving it open to the world. And if we're taking one thing away from this slide, it's don't leave your API open to the world. Technologies these days, such as Azure, make it so easy to be able to implement API gateway security that there's really no reason not to. You know, I've been guilty of this myself where I just want to innovate quickly and stand, stand an API up quickly to deliver value. And I want to think about security later. But we're seeing that with the, the number of hacks and API misuse these days, that this is not going to be something that can lead an organization to be successful in the future. So secure your APIs. And what is API gateway going to, API gateway security going to look like in practice? Well, for the purposes of, of today's demo, this is kind of, uh, we're gonna build upon this architecture here to build our layers of API security. So starting on the left, we're gonna see that clients and hackers can make requests into our system. And our system is comprised actually of, of three different API layers. And you can see at each one of these API layers, if we look at the kind of the blue bubble around the Azure gateway and both the MuleSoft gateways, I have API gateway security policies, different API gateway security policies implemented at my API gateway level. So anyone can make requests into this system and my, my first, API, which is an Azure API built in, in Azure API Manager, will proxy requests off to a MuleSoft application. And ultimately what we're after here is we're getting Pokemon information. 
And um, our, our process API swim lane there is going to kind of crunch some data between a Pokemon uh, API uh, that we have built or a public Pokemon API if it doesn't find that information. And then our system API simply sits in front of the database and acts as a control point for access into that database. Again, all three layers have API gateway security on them, and we're going to build upon this, this architectural diagram throughout the course of this presentation. So what are the, what are the issues with API gateway security? Like I said, it's really good with rate limiting and throttling and, and ensuring that only people with authenticated access can make requests to your API. But what it's not good with protecting is OWASP top 10 type of attacks. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So your second line of defense now, your second layer of API security would typically be a web application firewall. And your web application firewall could um, be built in the cloud so you don't have to manage it, or it could be uh, you know, a hardware appliance if you're in an on-premise environment. And your web application firewall is great with protecting against those OWASP top 10 type of attacks. And if you're not familiar with OWASP top 10, is the top 10 attacks that have been identified by the security community. It's actually a report um, that, that comes out of the top 10 attacks that the security community knows about. And it's attacks like SQL injection, and cross-site scripting, and body scanning, and distributed denial of service. And this is what we know about. What's really scary is what we don't know about, right? And so the vulnerabilities with your second line of defense, your web application firewall, are advanced API attacks from authenticated hackers that fly under the radar of distributed denial of service detection and can breach your first line of defense, which is your API gateway security, and your second line of defense in your web application firewall. But again, your web application firewall is great for detecting and preventing those OWASP top 10 attacks. And moving on to our next slide, we're going to build upon that architecture diagram that we just saw. And so now the only new piece in this architecture diagram is our Azure Web Application Firewall. So this is built in Azure's front door. And what it does now is it forces all requests, starting on the left, from clients and hackers to go through our Web Application Firewall before hitting our system. So the huge benefit here is that this web application firewall is going to filter out any types of attacks that it knows about before it ever gets to our system. So for example, if a hacker requests um, a, a, into our Pokemon environment here using a SQL injection attack, trying to, to you know, probe our environment and get information that they might not usually get, they would be blocked automatically by our web application firewall and that request would never actually make it to that Azure gateway or, or into our system in the first place. The web application firewall would block them before they ever even made it into our system. So huge benefit there. So now you have two layers of security, protecting against your OAuth top 10 type of attacks and you're, you're authenticated. Uh, you're ensuring that users are authenticated. So let's switch gears here just a little bit and talk about the API landscape. And, and real quick, I wanna look at the Zoom chat and see if there's any questions. Uh, please feel free to, to ask questions in the chat as we move on here, and I'll try to answer them as best I can, and, and we'll definitely have time for questions at the end. How do hackers find those cryptic APIs at all? That's a, that's a really good one. So uh, I've been at the receiving end of this um, many times, and, and if you've ever stood up an API environment, you will notice that bots just scan the internet and they scan the internet at different IP addresses and, and different common API endpoints. And what they can do is, is if they get a hit, you know, they can start to dive deeper and deeper and deeper into a particular path that they might get a, you know, a successful response on. Um, so they're using machine learning and artificial intelligence really just to be able to, to scan the entire internet. Uh, Simon, uh, good question. All right. Um, so let's move on to the, the current API landscape. And like I said, please feel free to put in any questions in the chat and we'll be sure to get to those. Um, the current API landscape. So the API train has left. It's, I think that's pretty obvious. That's why everyone is here. We're looking to protect our APIs because we know that the acceleration of the rate of APIs being created in our environments today is like nothing we've ever seen before. It's, it's exponential growth. And I truly believe that all future value will be delivered through APIs in one way or another. 
And it's really what's what's leading to digital transformation initiatives being successful. Your your uh, organizations love APIs because they can reuse them. They deliver value to the business through security and, and secure access points and control points to systems, and they allow systems to talk to one another. And so, you know, executives and VPs and directors love APIs because of the, the speed and reuse that they provide. But guess who's equally as excited about the APIs being created today? Well, hackers are, and that's what we're sort of here to talk about. So this next graph looks almost exactly the same as, as the previous graph, where the number of attacks we're seeing is a direct correlation between the number of APIs created. So we're seeing that as our attack surface grows, as we create APIs, hackers are absolutely loving them, right? Hackers are, are able to um, utilize this attack surface that we're creating to their advantage. So we have to be able to protect these APIs effectively. So the last couple of years, because of this, because of the rising number of APIs and the rising number of hacks, were not a great year for folks tasked with protecting APIs. We saw that many major companies like Facebook and Google have gotten breached due to API breaches. And these are companies that are typically considered on the forefront of, of the technology industry, right? These are, these are companies that we look to as leaders in our industry, yet they're still getting hacked. And why is that? Well, we're gonna answer that question here in just a little bit. But I think it's very common, number one, that people who are creating APIs do not feel very confident in actually protecting those APIs. And in fact, you know, it's, it's over half of people um, uh, in, at, in the security team are not actually aware of APIs. So it, it creates this huge problem. And I believe in that design phase, if we ask questions like who owns APIs and who's tasked with securing them and who's in charge of documenting them and how will you sustain them and, and security teams argue that they're not aware of all of APIs, but developers argue that they're not in charge of actually securing them because they don't feel confident in actually securing them. So in that design phase is where you might bridge that gap. And one of the really, really difficult reasons that it's so hard to protect your APIs, number one is because we don't know about API breaches many times until many months or years after they actually occur, it's extremely difficult to be able to detect API breaches. And if you ever created an API and sifted through API logs, especially at high volume, you're dealing with a true needle in a haystack. There's a lot of data flying through your APIs. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But for example, Google took over two years to be able to detect their API breach. Facebook took a year and a half to be able to detect very API breach. So these times to actually detect that first breach, number one is absolutely crucial in protecting your data in your organization. And number two, it's absolutely flabbergasting how high that is right now. And so like I said, it's, it's a true big data problem. You're getting a, the highest volume of traffic that we've ever seen across your APIs right now, and it's only going to increase. And the velocity of those connections is also increasing at a rate that we've never seen before. And we're seeing the different types of requests and responses vary so much now that it's impossible to keep up with how this API is changing and how it's being used from all the different clients that you've given access to make requests to your APIs. So it's almost a, a perfect dichotomy if you think about this. InfoSec professionals, and I'm glad you, you all put where you're, you're coming from, what your role is in your organization, because InfoSec professionals, and you can disagree here in the chat, are charged with protecting data. And the dichotomy is that API developers are charged with exposing data. It's, it's the exact opposite roles, right? And, and so API developers who are exposing data feel like they don't have many times the skills necessary to be able to protect an API effectively. And InfoSec professionals probably have those skills, but they claim that they're not aware of all APIs because maybe the communication between the two groups isn't, isn't good enough and, and InfoSec isn't involved in API development initiatives. And so I truly believe one of the main things that you can do to help protect your APIs is, is actually communicate between those two groups 
and use the strengths of the InfoSec professionals and use the strengths of the API developers to your advantage and combine them to be able to create your, your robust API security posture. And answer the question, who is responsible for APIs? That is what it's about in the end. So is InfoSec charged with, with securing APIs? Is the API development group is another group maybe charged with securing your APIs. And so leading up to the, the, the third layer of security here, for me personally, I'm not as worried about attacks that, that we know about, like the OWASP top 10 or brute force type of attacks. I'm mostly worried about attacks that we don't know about and that the, the hacker's artificial intelligence is learning from and creating a model of our API to be able to model that behavior and create attacks in a new way because every blocked attack using these scripts from hackers leads to a new attack. Maybe it comes from an IP address in one way that gets blocked, it's going to come from a different IP address next time that attack is going to get a little bit smarter. So I'm worried personally about, about those types of attacks and insider threats and data theft and application control and account takeover because that's what's really scary. We don't know, number one, when that's going to occur and it's extremely hard to be able to detect as we talked about. So how can we protect against those type of attacks? And the answer is fighting fire with fire. And that is we need to be able to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to protect our APIs if hackers are using machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to use our APIs to their advantage. So machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to do something similar that, that hackers are doing. It's going to model the behavior on your API and continuously build a security model. And then it can look for deviations from the learned behavior and detect if the deviation from the learned behavior might be an anomaly or it's actually an attack. And if it's an attack, it's, it can then block your attack and, and block that attack at the actual identity that made it. And so maybe that actual identity uh, might not be an IP address, right? But maybe it's a, a token or a key that's, that's making these um, requests to your API. And it can then notify an alert on, on when it actually blocks an attack. And so that's where ping intelligence for APIs would enter the picture. And this would be your third layer now of security. And ping intelligence for APIs offers three pillars to its, its value on. And number one is deep API visibility. So it can dynamically discover APIs across your environments and monitor your APIs. It's a huge value add. It can, uh, probably the, the most important thing, right? It can do threat detection and blocking. So as it's building its machine learning model and the normal behavior of your API, what it can do is detect deviations from that normal behavior and block those deviations from the normal behavior because that's probably coming from an insider threat or an advanced type of attacks, as well as sprinkle in API honeypots into your environment. And then self-learning. There's no need now with a machine learning and artificial intelligence model to be able to update security policies or manage those policies because this is going to be a continuously adapting model because it's using the machine learning and artificial intelligence in the background. And so this is all built on the concept of zero trust. And if you're not familiar with zero trust, what zero trust is, that zero trust is building a tight perimeter around your API and everything coming into and out of that perimeter is checked and treated equally. And with equality means that it's not going to trust anything, right? So it's, it's going to verify who, what, when, where, why, how for every single request and response coming into and out of that tight perimeter. And I'm happy to talk about that more if anyone's curious about zero trust. So how can ping intelligence uh, line up with your APIs? Your APIs, like I said, are, are great with content injection, uh, with your web application firewalls and, and, and your flow control and your access control. And where ping intelligence comes in is that third layer where it can do the automated detection and blocking of advanced attacks and sprinkle in honeypots and give you the deep visibility and reporting that you need when attacks actually occur in your API environment. So lining these three layers up together, I, I think helps you see the advantage to each one where 
Number one, without any one of these three layers, I personally would not sleep well at night. And, and so the, the recommendation for any API environment would be implementing all three of these layers to have the most robust API security posture. So your API gateways give you that API management and security policies at the gateway level. Web application firewalls protect against the lost top 10. And then ping intelligence augments your API security as a last line of defense against those advanced attacks that you may not be aware of and may not be able to detect in the case of Google and Facebook for years and years. And so in summary, we know that API breaches go undetected for a very, very long time. It's hard to detect those API breaches. And a zero trust strategy for steering APIs is absolutely crucial. You need to be able to really question everything coming into your API environment and out of your API environment. It's interesting that Gartner says by 2022, API abuses will be the most frequent attack vector that result in breaches. I would be willing to guess that this might even be by 2020 or 2021. This is probably right around the corner. Uh, 2022 is, is coming up very quickly, but uh, with the rise of hacks that we're seeing, especially with everyone at home these days, it's, uh, it's a formidable um, increase in attacks that, that we're seeing. Uh, and those attacks can't be detected with traditional API security. I have been tasked with creating APIs in the past, and I've been tasked with monitoring those APIs in the past. And I would not want to be able to try to detect that needle in a haystack that is flying under distributed denial of service radars. It's an authenticated attack and grabbing information from your API that sort of fits in with, with all of the other API traffic that you might have. And so ping intelligence plus API gateways is how you can protect your APIs. So let's take a look at the architectural diagram for API gateway security just one more time. We're gonna build on this where this diagram shows that we only have API gateway security built on our APIs. And then now on top of that, we have our web application firewall helping to protect against a lost top 10. And then now on top of that, we can have ping intelligence integrated into this environment as our third layer. And it's really important to note here that ping intelligence is integrated into this environment as a sideband policy is what it's called. So the communication from your APIs to ping intelligence is completely asynchronous, meaning it's not going to affect the performance on your APIs when you hook in ping intelligence. So, you know, one of the common concerns that, that people have, and, and rightfully so, is adding layers to your API security posture might affect performance and it might affect the latency, therefore affecting the user experience, um, whoever is, is uh, consuming your APIs. But with this, it's, it's completely asynchronous. The communication goes out to ping intelligence. Ping intelligence can crunch its data using its algorithms and using its machine learning model and artificial intelligence to be able to determine if there's deviations from the normal behavior. And then it can communicate back to your APIs asynchronously to be able to block that threat. And so let's demo all of that. This is kind of the, the fun part. Let me get out of, uh, I'm gonna pull up Postman. I'm actually gonna pull up uh, MuleSoft here really fast. And so the first thing we're going to look at, number one, is, is how do we implement those gateway security policies? And this is MuleSoft. If you're not familiar with MuleSoft, that's okay. I'm, I'm gonna talk through this and this is not going to be a uh, technology specific discussion. We're, we're more just looking at how would you implement those API gateway policies? So you can hear, uh, you can see rather uh, on our Pokemon API, that we have quite a few API gateway policies. We have rate limiting in there, and JSON threat protection, and HTTP-based authentication. And you're also going to see here the, the ping intelligence policy. So ping intelligence, what it's going to do is a custom policy that's provided by ping that allows you to very simply basically copy and paste their policy to be able to communicate with the ping intelligence engine and allow you to Sorry, I can't see my, my mouse here. Allow you to uh, communicate with ping intelligence so ping, ping intelligence can help you start to block those advanced attacks on your APIs. And then one second, I can't actually see my mouse. So let me uh, move this, this down. Here we go. Okay, so, and then it'll be very similar now in Azure. In Azure, we have our Pokemon API. 
And within our Pokemon API, what you're going to be able to do is implement those same type of gateway policies. And you know, so in, in Azure, if you simply click on add policy, very similar in MuleSoft, you would be able to start, for example, validating JOT tokens almost right away. Very, very easy to set up and implement. If you want to implement IP whitelisting, you can do that very, very easily, right? I would 100% recommend this as a base approach, a bare minimum approach. And then getting back into the inbound processing, what uh, Ping Intelligence allows you to do is, again, basically copy and paste a, a custom policy there. And if you look on the inbound processing side, you don't necessarily need to know what all of this does. But at the bottom, you're going to see that it's sending a one-way request. And it's sending that one-way request asynchronously out to Ping Intelligence. So Ping Intelligence can crunch that data, model the behavior of your API, and use that to be able to detect and prevent attacks on your API. So that's coming in on the request side. And then what this API is meant to do is proxy requests off to our MuleSoft application. And our MuleSoft applications, as we saw in the architectural diagram, are going to get that Pokemon information and return that Pokemon information ultimately. So essentially our Azure API here is proxying those requests off to the MuleSoft application. So we're kind of mining those technologies that we're seeing with many of our clients today. And then on the outbound side, on the response side, Again, you can see here that we're sending the one-way request. And this is part of, again, that custom policy with Ping Intelligence, where it's going to send the one-way request out to Ping Intelligence, so Ping Intelligence can now model the behavior of the responses of your API, which is also extremely important, because requests might look the same or normal, but maybe responses are looking a little bit different. You know, maybe you get larger responses than normal, or you know, you're starting to get information from your API that normally would not be produced by your API because a hacker has found a flaw in your, your API's implementation. So we're looking at that request data and the response data and sending that out completely sideband to Ping Intelligence. And then that would return the response once you're done with that back to the caller. And you set this up in Azure in a very similar way as you would with MuleSoft. Again, basically a copy and paste where you point your communication here to uh, your ping intelligence implementation and you're you're off and running and now let's look at that second layer of api security which is your web application firewall again very easy to implement with the tools that are given to us today and you know granted i am 100 percent in the cloud here and you know th this might be a little, become a little bit more difficult uh, with an on-premise or hybrid implementation but at least in the cloud and with these tools that you can use today to front or proxy your, your APIs with, you can stand up these front doors to be able to protect against those OWASP top 10 type of attacks. And so this is front door provided by Azure that you can see is starting to help block attacks from the OWASP top 10. So you can see the header injection is going to prevent against, and it's going to prevent against PHP injection and cross-site scripting and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so our web application firewall here now is, is proxying those requests into our system. And a typical best practice here, I didn't actually do this for my demo because I need to make requests to all of my APIs, is your APIs will not be able to accept requests from anything other than your web application firewall. And what that allows you to do is, is it forces all communication to go through your web application firewall so nothing can actually come in behind the web application firewall and, and make requests to your system. So you can do that, you know, with, um, uh, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can do it with networking rules, IP whitelisting, a couple other ways. Um, so that would be the API gateway security and now the, the second layer of security, the web application firewall. And let's, let's demo those. And I'm going to hack my API here just with some very, very simple hacks. And so you can see here that what I'm doing is, is I'm pointing directly to my Azure API. I'm not pointing to the web application firewall quite yet. And I'm just going to send a request off to my Azure API to get some Pokemon information for Mew. There's one Pokemon. And if you're not familiar with Pokemon, it's, it's not a big deal. Basically, Pokemon are kind of creatures that, that battle each other in, uh, uh, in, this, in this anime cartoon. 
Um, so mu, okay, we've, great. We've got an ability for mu, weight, height, and a, and a transaction ID. And I can do the same for Pikachu is a more commonly known Pokemon. Again, just making requests directly to the API. And what I can model now is somebody without uh, the, the access to be able to make requests to your API, hitting your API. So what I've done here is I have client ID enforcement implemented on my API. So if I mess up my client ID here, I won't be able to any longer make requests to my API. So we're validating that only people with valid access to my API have, can make requests to my API. And so if I fix that now, and then go to my authorization, I also have just a basic authentication just to be able to show this for the purposes of the demo. And if I mess up my username, again, same thing. My, my username needs to be test with a, a very secure password there, obviously. Um, so once I have access to that API, I can actually start to get responses from that API. But I've implemented those gateway policies so that it's not completely open to the world and not just anyone can make requests to the API. And so what are the problems with this, right? It's, it's the level two type of attacks. It's, it's the OWASP top 10 type of attacks. And so what we're seeing here is that now what I'm highlighting here is a SQL injection attack. And again, I'm pointing directly to my API. And if I send this request in, we're going to see that the SQL injection attack gets right through that API gateway security. And I'm able to get the response that I would want. And same with cross-site scripting. You can see that I just have a very simple script here um, in my parameters of my request. And I can send that through. And my API gateway security won't block that. So what do we need to do? We need to tack on that extra layer now of the web application firewall. So the web application firewall now, if you see my, my URL just changed a little bit here. I'm pointing to Azure front door, which is the web application firewall. We'll do the same thing. So all I'm doing again is getting Pokemon information here. And you know, again, I have my, my API gateway security implemented. So if I mess up you know, client ID, for example, I, I won't have access to this API. And if I now send any SQL injection attacks, again here in, in the header of my request, I'm going to be automatically blocked by that firewall without ever making it into the system. And same with cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting, again, the simple script right here in my parameters has been blocked by the firewall. So this request never made it into the system. So very, very valuable from both standpoints. Your API gateway security only allowing access to the people who have registered with your API or who you've given access to your API. And the web application firewall preventing misuse of your API from some of those most common of attacks. So now we looked at the two layers of security. Let's look at the third layer of security and that last resort uh, layer with, with Ping Intelligence. So what I've done here is I've mocked a, a script that a hacker might use. And this script, if we're going to look at the pre-request script, this took me all of you know, 10, 15 minutes to create. What this script is doing is it's going to mock a hacker who, uh, in this case, has a list of Pokemon that they want to probe this API with. But in a, a more real world case, this would be maybe a list of email addresses or maybe a list of usernames that a hacker has generated that they can just probe your API with. They have access to your API and they're trying to get information out of your API to maybe be able to level up on your API or obtain sensitive information from your API and then use that sensitive information, you know, potentially on, on the black market, right? So it's looping through these list of users, let's say. And then down here, it's also lo looping through a list of IP addresses. So this attack looks like it's coming from a different IP address every time. And that's all it took me here. And I have a little test, which we're going to see in a second, where basically, if, if I don't get a, a status of 403, um, then we're going to know about that. We'll see that in just a second here. So what this does, if I'm just going to send in a few requests, you see that I have a variable called SFX. And what that does, is it changes out the Pokemon and XFF to change out my IP address. So I send a couple requests here. That first one was for Raichu. Second one was for Mu. Third one's going to be for Mu2. And you kind of get the, the pattern here. My fourth one is going to be Bulbasaur. Each one of those came from a different IP address. And I'm now starting to attack my API. And all I did 
now I stop this in the background, was create a Postman runner script to be able to run that. And you can see here after a number of iterations in near real time that Ping Intelligence now, since that was hooked into my APIs, had, had not detected this and, and been able to block it. But then in near real time, after only a couple of minutes, it was able to detect that as an attack. And we see here in red that my test now is starting to fail. And it's blocked that identity from making any more attacks on my API. And so without me having to do anything and only hooking in Ping Intelligence and training Ping Intelligence to model the behavior of my API, it's detected this attack now completely hands-free from me. And so the last thing we're going to talk about is Ping Intelligence itself. So Ping Intelligence, now is uh, provides you a really pretty slick dashboard here and this is the kind of the monitoring and visibility aspect that you can hook into your api environment so what ping intelligence is going to give you i haven't made a whole lot of requests over the last seven days but it'll start to let you break down the the requests coming into your apis and break down what ip addresses are making requests what type of requests are coming into your apis and what have i actually blocked from the api environment so if we're going to drill into our Azure API, for example, you can see the information just related to the Azure API. And you can see that I'm making requests to all of these different types of, of, um, of URL paths. And we can see the most common type of requests as well. And even more pertinent than that, we start to break down the type of API attacks that we're vulnerable to and that have been blocked. So what this allows you to do, number one, is take action on the attacks. You can actually create automated alerts when you, when you get an attack. And number two, start to understand the vulnerabilities of your API environment. So let's say your, your only attack is extreme app activity. You know, maybe you, you can start to throttle your API back a little bit and uh, prevent any flooding coming into your system based on that. And Ping Intelligence is going to be able to, to block those and block those for good using a blacklist. And it's blocked here based on IP addresses. But if I search back a little bit further, let's do uh, last 60 days. We're going to see a bunch of different types of attacks here. And actually what I was looking for, let's go back here where I've actually been able to block a couple API keys as well, instead of just IP addresses. And this is now very powerful because blocking API keys is actually blocking the identity because we know that hackers can use different IP addresses to make requests to your environment. Actually blocking the key would completely prevent that identity from making any more requests to your environment. And what that might do is it might block a valid user, but it would also block the hacker. And you would know about this, number one, because of the automated alerts in, that you would set up. And then number two, because that particular user or system consuming your API would probably start to have errors if their API key got blocked. And you could simply disable that API key and provision a new API key for that particular system or user. So really, really powerful stuff. And, and Ping Intelligence comes with really great API endpoints that you could even slap your own dashboard on top of those API endpoints to be able to gain new insights into your environment. So that's the end of, of the demo, and I'm going to just quickly go back to PowerPoint. And so I, I will send this out after the meetup here. I uh, have plenty of references and documentation. Just going through these quickly. And don't hesitate to connect with me or Big Compass on any one of our social media pages. And at this time, uh, I would just like to thank everyone for, for joining. And I'll take any questions as well as pull up the chat box if there are any questions as we went on.